my strength when I am weak. Jesus, Lamb of God, you are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all.
Father God, you are awesome. Thank you, Lord God, for making us each and every day. Every day is a new day with you, Father God, no matter what yesterday had. Today's a new day. Tomorrow will be another day, and you're still making us, Lord God, to be like Christ. Help us to follow him in what you do and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, if you've been here for the last number of weeks, we've been working through the Old Testament, in particular the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And last week, I believe, was the first, and I don't know that it'll be the only, but I preached out of the book of Leviticus. You know, there's not a lot of sermons that come out of the book of Leviticus. Sometimes we could talk about mold and mildew. You know, but that only goes so far in the level of, of interest, really. But we're actually going to be moving through here now because we kind of covered Leviticus and dealing with the idea of the law, but we meet our Israelites. They're still at the base of Mount Sinai. As you recall, as we've gone through the story, they were led out of Egypt uh, by God, by Moses, and they came, they go over the Red Sea and they come down and they, they find themselves there at the base of Mount Sinai. And then while at the base of Mount Sinai, God speaks to them. He's got the cloud, there's the lightning and the thunder, it's just this great picture. Well, they stay at this base of this mountain for a, almost a full year. And in this process, so through, through some of these instructions that God had given to Moses, they create things, they create the tabernacle. We saw a little bit of a picture of it last week. They create this tabernacle, and, and with this tabernacle, there's certain pieces that are supposed to go into the tabernacle. So they create out of the gold and the silver and the other precious jewels that they were given, given by the Israelite or the Egyptians when they left Egypt. They take that stuff and they make it and they mold it and they create the things that God has called them to create. So they create this Ark of the Covenant. They create this altar by which this incense is going to be burned on. They create this brazen altar, which was intended for some of this pre preparation to be able to go and present themselves to God. You know, what we talked about that last week. They would have to do certain ritualistic cleansings as well as moral cleansings before they could even approach, get near to God in that holy place of his. And so they had these different regulations. And so during this time, during this year that they're at the base of the mountain, they're fulfilling what God had called them and makes them do in the sense of making these items. They had created these two silver trumpets. And with these trumpets then, this is one of the last things that they make because this is the moment now they're going to use these trumpets and they're going to have these signals sent with trumpets, almost like an army would, where you have certain blasts, certain reveries, if you will, that mean one thing versus another. And they have these trumpets, and so if you hear two blasts in the trumpet, that means basically all of these Israelites are supposed to gather at the tent of meeting and they're going to hear basically what's going to happen, where are we going, what's happening, and most likely it's ready, it's time to go. And there's, a, there's other signals. There's a one blast and followed by another one. And they each mean these different things. Sometimes it means that just the elders are going to come to the tent of meeting. You know, sometimes it means that they're going to stop. Sometimes it means that they're going to go. And throughout these different signals that are these blasts on these trumpets, they would know what it is that they're supposed to be doing. And so when we come to it here this morning, when this cloud is about ready to lift off of this tabernacle, because they spent this year making this tabernacle. It's a breakdown temple, is what it is. So they have these walls, 
tent walls, and then inside they have this other tent, which was the, inside that, then they had this veil, this curtain that we talked about before that kind of held the Holy of Holies, that's where the Ark would be. But it was all able to be broken down. You know, so they would break it down, pack it up, and then they would move. All right? And the cloud that represented God's presence with the thunder, thunder and the lightning and such, sometimes it would rise up from this tabernacle. And when this cloud would rise up, that meant it's time to go. And Moses would see that. And we're going to see that this morning. He would call out, all right, it's time to go. And so then they would pack up this tabernacle and pack up everything. And they'd start going where the cloud would lead them. And then there was times where the cloud would stop. And when the cloud would stop, then, all right, set up the tabernacle. And so they would set it up. And sometimes this would happen pretty, pretty quickly. And they, they would go from uh, maybe just overnight sleepy time and then the next day, they would have to pack it all up and they have to move to the next place and they would stop. But there was times where it would stop and stay there for a year, maybe a couple days, maybe a month. And God was the one that always would direct that. He would either rise up and he would move and they would follow and they would settle and they would stay there. But it was God who directed that. And so when the cloud would go, they would go. When the cloud would stop, they would stop. But they would always be following the direction that the Lord had said set for them. And so here we, we come to it. In Numbers chapter 10, we're going to be spending most of the time this morning in Numbers chapter 11, but in Numbers chapter 10, this is what we have here. This is the moment of, of the setting out. So they set out, in other words, so this cloud is lifting from the tabernacle and they're about ready to go. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and traveled for three days. This is significant because we're going to draw some parallels in a few moments of this idea of three days. And what happens now as they leave this mountain, we're going to see some similarities as to when they left Egypt. And it's going to be fascinating. I mean, just super intriguing, exciting, weird, if you will. And yet you're going to find yourself questioning why is one different why from the other. And it's just, it's really wonderful stuff. So they traveled for three days. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them. So they, these Levites would take this Ark... And they were led by this cloud, and they would go. And everyone else then would follow this presence of the Lord. The Lord directs, and the people follow. You're going to see that theme all the way throughout the book of Numbers. As the Lord directs, then the people would follow. And so they went before them for three days to find them a place to rest. And so they're following this. And it's interesting, during this year that they're at the base of the mountain, we see, you could call it a, a quiet time with just this, this interaction between the Lord and his people, and they're obeying him, and everything is really, really smooth. That things are interacting. It's like, wow, this relationship between us and the Lord is good. You know, everything is just following, but they're, they're following, they're obeying, and then, and then we see it change as they start hitting the road here. And then we find in Numbers chapter 10, this is just beautiful, and so this is why I included this. So whenever the Ark of the Covenant set out, Moses would say to this, you know, kind of calling out as to who's the one leading, he'd say, rise up, Lord, all right? We're not the ones leading. God is leading us, and he would basically spur God on, if you will, and say, rise up, Lord, may your enemies be scattered, and may your foes flee before you, recognizing the fact that you are the one that's taking us, and we are going to be following you. And then whenever it came to stop and rest, he said, return, Lord, to your countless thousands of Israel. What a fabulous picture of how Moses, their, the Israelite leader, basically takes his direction from the Lord and calls out to the attention to the Israelites, all right, rise up, Lord, now's your time. Now's your time to go. It's your time to shine. It's your time to do what it is that, that you want to do. And then when it comes to rest, Lord, come welcome back to your people at any time. So then we come to it in chapter 11. This is where I want to spend the time. And this is, this is just fascinating. Three days into it, all right? And if you remember, three days back in Exodus chapter 16. We'll touch on that in just a second. But just remember those parallels. So chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now the people complained. They complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord. And when he heard them, his anger was aroused. Then fire from the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the camp. So basically, the bottom line is this. They started on this road trip, all right? Three days into this road trip, they start to complain for, the word is, hardships that they're experiencing. Have you been on a road trip with children? Yeah, right? You know, it's like, seriously, that's hardship, all right? That's, there, there's aspects of road trips with children that are extremely difficult, and that's an understatement. You know, you, you find that when you have four children sitting behind you in a minivan, 
The, the things that they learn to fight about is just amazing. Seriously, we're going to fight about this? You know, hey, I found that French fry that's three weeks old. That's mine. You know, really, don't eat that. You have no idea that that's only three weeks old. You know, the, his, Isaac just crossed my line. Make him stop. He's looking at me. She's touching me. Whatever the case is, it's like, you got to be kidding me. You know, so as we're sitting in the front of the van listening to these hardships, as we find on the road trip, it's just maddening. But yet, that's, in a sense, that's kind of what we get here. We have, we have the Israelites heading out on this road trip, and they're three days into this road trip, and it's just like, this is, this is not smooth. This is rough. This is hard. And you understand, okay, there's a difference. We're driving in a, in a minivan with air conditioning, usually, uh, and you're going, well, that's different if you're taking a group of students to Mexico in a van without air conditioning. That's hardship. Sarah and I do pretty well. We'll talk about this later. Uh, Sarah and I do pretty well with, you know, her and I with four children, okay? We can handle that pretty well. Uh, Sarah and I can handle a group of 20 teenagers pretty well when it comes to these road trips, you know, and dealing with these hardships. But here's Moses with 600,000 Israelites. All right. I don't envy him in that capacity. But do we have these, these hardships as you're moving through? And it's just like, it, there's a challenge. Whenever you're moving like that, it's a challenge. And that's basically what we're looking at here. So the people head out and they begin to complain about the hardships. It's like, wow, we're going through the desert. It's so hot. Can we turn on the AC? Open the windows. Do we have to walk so far? Are we there yet? You know, are we there yet? Yeah, go ahead, hop out. Uh, and then it's interesting how we see this develop. You see how the Lord hears their complaints. They're three days into it, all right? And the Lord hears their complaints, and he calls this fire, and it consumes some of the outskirts of the camp, you know, creates almost this, this moment of, don't make me come back there. You know what I'm saying? Okay, oh, you're driving on the road trip, and the kids in the back are, are fussing and whatever. It's like, it's like, okay, I've had it. Don't make me pull this van over and stop. And that's, that's the image that I get with this idea of the fireworks. God sends this fire around. He basically consumes the outside of this camp. And I do believe that there were some Israelites who, who actually perished in this event. But what's fascinating is, all right, God's saying, you're complaining about your hardships. He calls on the fire and, and gets their attention Check it, okay? Listen to what's going on here. You're complaining three days into it. I'm taking you somewhere better, all right? So, in a sense, knock it off. And yet what we find then as we move on into verse 4, the rabble with them. And now the rabble, just so you understand, it's believed that the rabble that it's referring to here are the people of Egypt. If you recall way back, when we first started this series, the people of Egypt, there was some of them that went with the Israelites. You remember that? It wasn't all the Israelites. They were some of the Egyptians went with the Israelites. And so it's believed that the rabble, these rabble rousers, if you will, this crowd of complainers with them began to crave other food. That's an important statement. They began to crave other food. And then we find, and again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. Ah. So, as many of you are aware, I used to deliver pizzas. This was my previous career. I used to deliver pizzas for Pizza Hut. And in the process of delivering pizzas, you know, you, you go to your, your store, all you do is basically answer the phone and deliver pizzas and come back and answer the phone and deliver pizzas. But there's, there's a beautiful opportunity, and it seems attractive at the time, that when you get hired at a pizza restaurant, you get all the pizza you can eat, you know? And, and to an extent, that's true as long as the boss isn't around, okay? When the boss is, it's fascinating, you, know, you make all these pizzas, you throw them away, you, know, you, can't, you, you throw some of them away, but yet you're limited to what you're allowed to supposedly have. It's like, well, that's wasteful, but we don't want to break the company's pocketbook, I guess. Whatever. Anyway, this idea that, okay, so you're hired at the, at the pizza restaurant, and you get to have all the pizza you can want, and this is great for a week. And then you get tired of pizza, and you're ready for something else. Sometimes, sometimes yeah, kids never get tired of pizza. Our kids ate pizza three meals in a row. Okay, it wasn't really. We don't count breakfast. Three meals in a row this last week one time. I know, they love it. But there's this reality that you kind of get sick of it. So what we would do at Pizza Hut 
is we were down in Excelsior, and so right next door, here was our restaurant, right next door to us, same adjoining strip mall, they would cater uh, yachts or boat trips, tour trips on Lake Minnetonka. And sometimes we would offer a trade. And so we would get chicken cordon bleu while they got pizza, and they liked it, and we liked it. Sometimes we would trade with Haskell's across the street, and we'd get burgers and fries, and they would get pizza. You know, this was like, wow, something different that we get to eat. And then they would send me off on a delivery, and I'd come back, and it was all gone. <laughs> but you see, sometimes if you eat the same thing over and over again, you find yourself, all right, I've had enough pizza and I'm ready for something different. And it's kind of the picture that we're getting here with the Israelites. They are ready for something different. And what's interesting, so we see this scenario kind of play out, and at first glance, it looks like this is exactly the same thing that happened with the Israelites back in Exodus 16. If you recall, and I'll share it with you, back in Exodus 16, you remember three days into their trip, this is after they crossed the, the Red Sea, the Israelites crossed, and three days into it, they've gone with Remember that? Three days without water. And they come to Mara. And Mara means bitter. It was a place of bitter water. And Moses throws in the stick, and the water becomes sweet. All right? And they were able to drink it. Following that incident, the Israelites went off again, and they're like, they're hungry. They, they had no, no food to eat. And what's interesting is that you find, I think I've got it here. The Israelites said to them, all right, at this point, if we had only died at the Lord's hand in Egypt... We sat there, we sat around pots of meat, reminiscing about all the luxury that they had in Egypt. We sat around pots of meat and we ate all the food that we wanted. But you, they're talking to Mo, uh, Moses here, brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. It's interesting. Look at a few of the words here. Okay, if we had died by the Lord's hand, in other words, why didn't the Lord just kill us in Egypt and be done with it? Instead, the Lord, they recognized his sovereignty. They recognized who he was. They recognized what he was doing. Instead, God took us into this desert, and now we've got nothing to eat. They would have run out of their unleavened bread at this point. So up until this point, they had brought their own food with them. Remember that? That's why they celebrate the Passover the way that they do. They bring in their own dough without yeast because they didn't have time for it to rise. They're bringing their own dough, and they cook it. That's what they had. But they've run out of that provision, and here it has... This is what God does then. He provides for them. In this circumstance, he provides for them manna. And it says that he provides for them quail. So he, they had manna in the morning and they had quail at night. It's interesting in, in Exodus chapter 16, verse 35, it specifies that the Israelites had the manna for all 40 years of their desert wanderings. It says that. But it does not say that they had quail for all 40 years. That's an important distinction as we're looking at that quail appears to have been a limited supply, a limited time that they had that, but the manna was constant, all right? Because here's what we're doing. We're finding this, wow, this looks like the same story, but it's a different story. It's a different circumstance. Here, prior to the covenant that we found in Exodus 19, where God says, you will be my treasured possession. We're dealing with that week after week. You will be my royal priesthood. You will be my holy nation, which we dealt with last week. You are, this is my covenant. We've talked about that idea in Exodus 19 and 20. It was like a marriage ceremony. You know, up until that point, they were basically just engaged. They could have pulled the plug at any time saying, all right, I've changed my mind, I'm done. But we have that in Exodus 19 and 20. They have that marriage moment where they come together. They have their covenant, they promise, and God promises this. And the people answered and said, yes, we will do everything that you said. Boom, the marriage has happened. And so now their expectation has changed. And so at this point, when they were complaining, oh, we're so hungry, God provided for them. And now what we're going to see is something quite a bit, quite a bit different. And so there's some distinctions that I want us to understand. One is this idea that this covenant was pre-existent. In other words, this was pre-covenant. And the one that we're going to experience today in Numbers 11 is post-covenant. That's an important distinction. And the second distinction is this idea that in the Exodus occurrence, there was no food at that time. You know, because they had run out of the unleavened bread. There's no food. God provided them food. This one here, right there, oh, went too far. The rabble with them began to crave other food. In other words, they weren't hungry. They were not starving. They had what they needed, 
And there's a big difference, a big distinction with that reality. And so then we find a third distinction in this idea that because of the fact that this covenant had happened for the numbers one, this is in reality like an adulterous moment. And you see what the Israelites do. The rabble with them began to crave other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. And then we get into right here in verse 5. And they're going back into this reverting to their past. And this is after the covenant. It says, we remember the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost. Okay, seriously, that's a wake-up moment. They're saying, I remember the fish that we ate, and it was free. But they're not remembering their slavery. They're not remembering their oppression. How is that free? Maybe it didn't cost them any money, but it cost them a lot. And yet they're forgetting that piece of it, and they're saying, all I care about, I would work till my fingers fell off if you would just give me some fish, is in a sense. But what they're saying is, God, we had it better in Egypt. God, we had it better with the Egyptians and their gods than we do with you. In other words, I wish we hadn't ever married. You know, I, honestly, that's really what we're looking at here because this is after that covenant moment that they're kind of looking back and like, man, Egypt was good and you stink. That's really what we're seeing. And God sees this like, holy smokes, this is a major slap in the face. And so he says, remember the uh, the fish that we ate in Egypt at no cost, and also the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlics. Notice how these things have such a distinct flavor. You know what I'm saying? Okay, they've, they've been eating manna this whole time, and manna probably always tastes virtually the same. All right? There's two incidences, the Exodus 16 and the Numbers 11 does refer to it slightly different. We can get into that at some other time. But that's not really uh, our critical issue here this morning. But cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions, and, I mean, onions and garlic... You can tell when someone's eating onions and garlic, usually, right? It's like, whoa, what'd you have for lunch? <laughs> I had some garlic toast. Okay. <clears throat> but now, this is what the Israelites say, now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. In other words, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of what you're giving to me. I want something different, is what the Israelites are really saying to God. In, in some of our, our mission trips, one in particular comes to mind. And this was one we took a group of students to Ciudad Mier. And when we've gone on these missions experiences, there's always, almost always, been someone who comes along and their, one of their roles or their jobs is to basically ensure that the team has food to eat. And they would oftentimes make sure that it's a blend either of the cultural foods or a blend uh, along with the blend of American. And they just give you a variety that way. So you can experience different types of Mexican cuisine. You can experience how they view hamburguesos, so con quesos, et cetera, like that. But this one trip in particular, this person was not on the team. There was no person such as this on the team. And so we relied solely on the orphanage that we were staying at and working at and relying solely on whatever it is that they wanted to provide for food. It was the same thing every meal. I mean, I'm not kidding, every meal. Breakfast, lunch, supper, it made no difference. And it was refried beans and eggs. Every meal. And I'll tell you this, I was choking it down by the end of the 10 days. I mean, I was so ready for something to be different. I really, I mean, I, I, I was choking it down. When I say choking, like I couldn't breathe, okay? It was, it was rough, but the reality of it was, did we have food? Yes, we did. Did I want something different? Absolutely. And I, had you lost your appetite? It's like there wasn't a lot of motivation to go to lunchtime. There wasn't a lot of motivation to go to supper when that's what you knew what was going to happen. And so I can relate. I can understand what the Israelites are saying. I can understand what they're getting at. And as we go on and we, we see this, this interaction, we have this troubled, and I talked about this just a little bit before, you have this hardship that comes on the Israelites, and you have Moses leading the people. And you have Moses see him almost as this father, this parent, and he's got 600,000 people who are basically ready to skin him alive and say, we need some, something to eat. And Moses is like, Whoa, I can't handle this. And he approaches God in verses 10 and 11 and says, I need some help. Okay? 
I need you to to help me here because I, these 600,000 people, I can't handle them. I could maybe take one or two of them before they got the best of me, but I can't handle 600,000 people who are mad at me. In other words, he's saying, God, you have to do something. And he asks this question in verse 13, uh, in Numbers 11, 13. Notice the contrast here that we find in Mark as well. So in Numbers eleven thirteen, 13, this is what Moses says, where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me, give us meat to eat. And Moses is looking around in the desert. I got nothing. There's no meat here. What, what, I, they're going to kill me, maybe eat me, is really what perhaps could happen. And notice in Mark 8, 4, what a beautiful contrast when you look at the Gospels and what Jesus Christ, while he's here, his disciples, as Jesus said, well, give, you give them something to eat, is what he said. He's about ready to feed a multitude of people, about 5,000 people. And Jesus says to his disciples, well, you give them something to eat. Because they had just said, well, what are we going to do with all these people? Send them home so they can eat something. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And their answer is, uh, <laughs> we're in this remote place. Can anyone get enough bread to feed them? We got nothing. What an amazing picture that we have thousands of years before where Moses is in this position where I got nothing to provide them to eat. They're ready to, to hang me. And we see this situation here where Jesus calls them, you give them something to eat, and the disciples, I got, I got nothing. And in both cases, we see a God who provides food, but it's fascinating in the way that we look at it here. An interesting contrast here, too, is we could pull in John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, very similar situation where Jesus just fed a multitude of people. He refers to himself, he says, I am the bread of life. He is the one that provides the food, the satisfaction. He says, I am the bread of life. Uh, so we find then in, in verse 14, which I don't have up here. That's okay. But Moses needs help. And so God's going to send him this help. All right? So he, he calls on these elders. Basically, God pulls in 70 guys, 70 people. It's believed that these 70 people could very well have been the initial starting point of what got, got to be known as, um, oh, I just lost the word now, um, the Sanhedrin. Okay, so we find when Jesus refers to, they had these 70 elders, if you will, in the Israelite uh, history. It's believed or thought to possibly be true that these 70 elders that God brings to Moses to help him with these 600,000 people could have been the beginnings of the Sanhedrin. Um, so he, he, he calls to these, these 70 people, and then God comes down on them in his spirit, and they begin to prophesy. And it's just an interesting piece. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's just a very interesting piece as you read through Numbers 11 there where uh, Joshua comes to, is it a Joshua, right? Yeah, Joshua comes to, to Moses and says, oh, there's two guys that didn't join us over here and they're prophesying too. This is not okay. You have to stop them. And Moses basically says to Joshua, he says, well, here's the thing. What are you jealous for? Are you jealous that I'm not getting the attention? In other words, refocus here. Who's really important? If God wants to make someone prophesy, God's going to make them prophesy. Let them prophesy. It's fascinating. Okay, then we get into verses 19 and 20. And so God, this is God's answer to the Israelites, and they're complaining. They're saying, oh, man, Egypt was so awesome. Remember we had that fish, and we had those cucumbers, and we made that fish cucumber salad? You will not eat meat for just one day. Well, this sounds good. You know, the Israelites, <laughs> bonus, he's not just giving us meat for a day, all right? And he says, or two days. Wow, it's going to be more than two days or not even five days. This keeps getting better and better, right? And so he says to the Israelites, 10 or 20 days? No, but a whole month you're going to get food. You're going to get meat to eat for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and you loathe it. Say, like, wait a minute. That was going real good there for a while. But the last part, I'm not quite so, so keen on because you have rejected the Lord. In other words, you've taken what God had provided and you said, this isn't good for me. This isn't what I want. I want something different. Thanks, but no thanks. And I think we're going to see that next week as well. There's this arrogance like, you know, God, you gave me something. I don't, I'm not really hungry, but this is, it's, it's manna. I want something better. And God, who has just given them and provided for them, and there's this bigger picture that they're totally not seeing, and we're going to touch on that in a moment. Because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wailed before him, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? So he's going to give them meat to eat. And then... 
The Lord answered Moses, it is the, Lord, is the Lord's arm too short? This is Moses' question, but where am I going to get this food? You just promised them. In other words, God, you just promised them meat. And I don't think this is really a question so much, uh, Moses, to God saying, all right, how are we going to do this? As much as like, just so you know, this is all you, okay? And so Moses asks him the question, where, how are we going to do this? What's going to happen? And the Lord answered Moses saying, is the Lord's arm too short? I just love that phrase. Is there anything that God can't reach? and take care of? Is God's arm too short that he can't handle whatever you're dealing with? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. And then we find a wind. Oh, I'm a little ahead of myself. We find this wind. I know, you're going to see that in a second. Just hang tight. So what? That looks so much better than you. Okay. <clears throat> That's right, I got a picture of me too. Uh, so we have this wind. God sends this wind that comes up. And this wind blows in these, these birds, this quail. And it talks about this quail basically spreads out for a full day's walk. You know, the, the amount that it would take you to be able to walk a full day, which could be one of two ways or one of two things. One is it could just be an individual. How far can an individual walk? It was kind of thought to be about 30, 32 miles or so in a day. So it's like this quail flock could be like 30 miles long. Or it could have been shorter because if you'd taken all 600 Israelites, it wouldn't be, I mean, you're not going to go 32 miles with 600 Israelites, and it could be as short as 10 miles. So anywhere between 10 to 30 miles worth of quail. And it says it was two cubits deep. That's like a meter, okay? Two cubits would be about a meter. <laughs> That's a lot of birds. You ever go pheasant hunting? That wouldn't really be called hunting, would it? Okay. There are some, sometimes in, in the, this part of the world... Uh, there's still, the quail is abundant, okay? And it's seasonal, and I think what we're looking at here is somewhat seasonal too, but they would, in fact, they'd get so thick where you could, you could get them with a broom, you know, where literally you swing your broom, not like a bat, because usually there's just one bat, and they're really hard to find and hard to get at. But you, hit, you could knock the quail down, but it says that there's so many quail, and the Israelites just go crazy over the quail, so this is the closest thing I could come. Well, except for Alfred Hitchcock, the birds would t probably be totally sim similar to this. But uh, so Chris and I, this is this last week, I was invited to go to a field trip on Friday with her and her second grade class. And so we went, and they have, this is at the, the uh, Safari North up north of Brainerd, and she's got a couple of birds there on a stick. You can buy these sticks, and you hold the stick out, and they have all these parakeets that come in and land on your popsicle stick and eat the seeds that are glued onto the stick. It's fascinating. There's a lot of birds in there. And I, I wouldn't be lying if I wasn't afraid of getting you know, dropped on once or twice. I did not, but I got out of it as quick as I could. Uh, anyway, so this is two, two birds that, that perched on Carissa's stick there. And then she couldn't hold it. It got, it got to be too heavy, you know, and so then she handed it up to me. And then I have, oh man, there's like eight birds, and they're all fighting over it. But this whole airy, airy, airy how do you say that? Airy, airy, airy. This bird area, uh, I just totally switched it. This bird area was just filled with these birds. You know, they were all over the place. And we even had one land on Chris's friend's head. I know. I'm just glad it didn't nest or lay an egg or something like that. But th that's why she's on there. I just took a picture. <clears throat> but it's fascinating when you see all these. And that was a lot of birds. And it has nothing. It's nothing compared to what the Israelites experienced here when you have 10 to 30 miles and a meter deep of quail. And then their reaction, the Israelites. So they began to basically attack these these quail and kill them and start to eat them. I'm hoping they're cooking them first. I don't know that. But they began, and they're just devouring on this. Have you ever eaten something that didn't sit well with you? You know, it's interesting. This, I, I, I'd coached wrestling for a number of years, and there was one year where we had made the state wrestling tournament. There were several, but the one year in particular I'm referring to, and roughly about a 145, 152-pounder. You know, they, they go without eating certain things through most of the year, you know, or even quantities. We get to the state tournament, and at the state tournament, you have daily weigh-ins. Well, there's, there ends up being inevitably, in any wrestling season, a final weigh-in. And it happens, I would say, 80 plus, 85% of the time, where after that final weigh-in, you find a, a loss of self-control with this person who has deprived themselves of some of the things that they like to eat. 
And our 145 pounder, 52 pounder, he, he overdid it. And his body was not ready to overdo it. And he got sick and couldn't wrestle in our final dual meet that night. I mean, it just, it was, it was unfortunate for him. And that's what we see here, where you see the Israelites. And before this quail, they're just gorging themselves. And they have had nothing to eat for over a year than just manna. And suddenly they've gorged themselves on this quail. And bef- while the quail is still between their teeth, they're getting sick. Their bodies are not in a position to handle this. Do you think God knew what was best for them? I mean, do you think there was a reason where God had said, I'm giving you manna, and manna will sustain you? I know it's not variety, but this is what you need right now. This is what your bodies will, will, will react well to. Do you think God had an idea that, this was, that he, what he had in mind was good and not just something minimal? And suddenly, if you want meat? Okay, there you go. Have at your meat. Oh, that meat really made me sick, man. It's like, wow. God knows everything. And he does it because he wants what's best for us. And the Israelites had no idea. And then we can, we can take this a little bit further and we can kind of look at it this way. There's a bigger picture that's going on. God is taking the Israelites away from Mount Sinai into the promised land. And have you ever stopped to really think on how this story that we just talked about this morning, not, all, not only how it relates to us, but how it's, it's part of our story? Because you've got to realize this, that what God is doing here with the Israelites that we're reading about and reading about their history is really our history. I know we're not Israelites, but when we look at what God is about to do and is going to do through thousands of years, but he's doing it, even now, he's bringing up a Savior who's going to save the world from its sins. We are affected. We are directly tied to this story. I mean, do you see that? Do you think God had the best in mind for Israel when he gave them only manna? Do you think God had the best in mind for them when they enter into the desert, leaving Mount Sinai? He's taking them to the promised land. We're going to see that next week where they come to the threshold. He's doing that for them because he's got what's best in mind for them. Do you think God had your best in mind even while the Israelites were in the desert? Because that's our story. This is exactly our story. God had your best in mind as the Israelites were crossing the desert. Because it's through this nation that he has established that he's going to bring about Jesus Christ. And do you think God had your best in mind as Jesus hung on the cross? I think so. Do you see that? This is our story. Not just that we can relate to, but it's part of us. So I want you to see, in the New Testament, Paul writes this. There's this idea. And we see what the lessons that the Israelites learned, or at least should have learned, and what we can learn from that, but also this idea of of who we we belong to. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul writes it this way, in verses 10 through 13. Paul says, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. Verse 11. I am not saying this because I am in need. This is the important part. For I, this is Paul, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And then he says, I can do all things, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Our culture is so opposed to you being content. You know what I'm saying? Our culture does not want you to be content. Despite the advertisements that you see, they make you think that this is what we want for you. We want you to have this and this so that you can be happy and content. That's the message that's conveyed. They don't want that. Our culture wants you to be discontented because when you are discontented, you find yourself Wanting, our culture wants you to want. That's just, it's a reality. I'm sorry that it's a reality, but it's a reality. Our culture wants us to be in want. Jesus wants you to.
to find contentment. He wants you to find that he is enough. He wants you to find that despite the fact that you're going through hardship, because I know that there's some people in this room who are going through immense, difficult hardship. I know it. I could name them by name. I'm not going to, but I know it. And that's so hard, and I'm so hard, it's so hard for me to see it. And I'm so sorry that you have to go through it. But the reality of it is every one of us is going to face some form of hardship. You know, some more difficult than others. That's the reality, okay? But even through these hardships, God's gospel will go forward. You know, it's through the hardships of the Israelites going through the desert that blessed us because we have a Savior that came through Israel. It is through the apostles' hardships. Many of them were killed and persecuted for their faith. It is through their hardships that we have the freedom that we do in Christ. That we as a church exist because they planted the church. It is through their hardships that we're blessed. And I know this as well, that many of the ones who I, I'm thinking of who have gone through and are going through immense hardships, even in this room, the gospel has gone forward and people have been blessed. And I know that that can be really hard. That doesn't make it any easier. But it gives you a, pi a picture, a perspective that, you know, God is enough. Maybe I'm only eating manna, but that's what he has for me right now. Maybe I'm traveling through this desert and it's dry and it's just really hard. I can't handle this. And we want to just complain. And I understand that. You know, we, the, the phrase goes, you know, can't complain. Nobody listen if you did. You know, compl some, can't complain. Sometimes I still do. And we do that. But God is enough. And that can be really hard to internalize. Because we see others who have more, it's like, oh man, I want that. But God is enough. He's enough for you. He's enough for me. He's enough for this church. He's enough. He's all we need. And we use that phrase, but I don't know how often we really, really internalize the phrase. Have you found yourself to be sometimes caught up in the mundane, the same old, same old, and have turned your eyes away from where the Lord is leading to what it is that you feel like you want? Have you found a satisfaction in Jesus? Are you content with him? Or is the enemy trying to deceive you and make you think that you need something? Or you need something more to find enough? Sometimes it can be so difficult to not know what God is doing, but yet he's enough. Kevin, would you come and lead us? We have a good, good father. Well, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never You are 
Lord, we thank you that you have given to us enough, that you care enough for us, that you had this all planned out in advance to save us, to provide Christ, our Savior, sanctifier, healer, coming King. So we glorify you this morning because you are enough. In Jesus' name. Amen. So may you go and know that he is enough, that you have enough, and that you can relish in his goodness.